Duncan Rupert, I was thinking on the way over here that um, your piece might be subtitled Not the Christmas Show. <laughs> um, I mean, was, was the timing by design or by coincidence? I suppose Christmas being the time of rampant consumerism, mm. it kind of works, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, there, there's, um, I mean, there's a number in the show which is almost like a classical Christmas number and the end of the first act finishes at Christmas. So it's definitely got a festive feel at one level or, or is in dialogue at least with what, what festive shows are. But actually, to be fair to Michael Attenborough, my predecessor here at the Almeida, I think he's traditionally at this theatre liked doing challenging stuff at Christmas to offer an alternative to all the pantos out there. So he liked that idea. Even subversive. Yeah. <laughs> Duncan, whose crazy but brilliant idea was it to musicalise this notorious piece? It was not mine. There are, are American producers. There's a young guy named Jesse Singer who optioned the rights from Brett, and he had this kind of you know crazy idea of turning American Psycho into a musical. He uh, got in touch with, with Roberto Sacasa, the writer, and then myself in 2009. You know, we started kind of talking about this this idea, and I was a little bit loath to jump into it at first because I had read the book in college. You know, I, I love Brett, but when I read the book initially, I, I had a kind of a rough time with it. I found it really off-putting for, some, for, people for some of the obvious reasons. Yeah, yeah. But then when I reread the book in 2009, I found it to be this kind of amazing text and prescient and something that, that I could really sink my teeth into. And it made me think about it a new way of maybe using music in the context of musical theater. So then I got very excited about it. She's got great tips. Got such a great ass. She really takes the hits. I wanna make a pass. She's got great tits. She's got such a great ass. Oh, she's the kind of chick that doesn't need to last. She got great tits. How did the Almeida get involved with the project? A couple of years ago, I got approached by Jesse, the American producer, via my agent in New York, and initially just I was going to work on it as a freelance director. Our plan was very much to do it in the States. And then we did a workshop in 2011, I think, in New York that was only a week, but was quite informative about the next way. And, and in the States, there's much more of um, a culture of workshops. And We were know, talking about yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, things take <laughs> a spring awakening is testament to you. But great yeah. works take a while yeah. to make. Uh, so we talked about what the next step was. And at that point, I wasn't the only dose to that headlong. And, and I said, well, would you be interested in doing it in England? It might be less exposing. And so we started talking to other people about it. And then the Almeida were interested. Coincidentally, I then or during that period, left head on to join the Almeida. So it was a sort of perfect set of handshakes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What we have here, basically, is a very twisted take on the greed is good culture of the capitalism in the 80s and a perversion of the American dream. And weirdly, I mean, where we're at now as victims of that very boom period seems to add a perspective mm -hmm. to Brett Easton Ellis's mm -hmm. novel. You're obviously very, you must be very conscious of that at this time. I mean, to a certain extent, the rapacious effects of boom bust economics are probably always timely. You know, it's, it's interesting, I did yeah. Enron a few years ago, and that felt incredibly timely because we were in the jaws of a recession. Um, so, so, of course, it is. But I think that the thing that I find interesting about American Psycho is, is as much to do with how contemporary culture is looking to the 80s stylistically in fashion and in music, and mm -hmm. we see a lot of sort of re reclaiming of both the countercultural elements of the 80s, you know, the Smiths or whatever it might be, Morris's new biography, but also the more ironising or actually sort of celebrating at some level other aspects of the Breed is Good culture, you know, whether it's sort of Brian Ferry-esque or Royal Palmer element or through to the, the fashion. I mean, actually, my assistant said something, we did some research, and apparently in, on Wall Street anyway, 
the wealth gap between male and female colleagues in the time of this novel was the most equal it's ever been. So there were some other things going on there that people don't know about so much that are kind of interesting, as well as the obvious sort of evil banker kind of take. I will not touch a drop of red wine Don't want to ruin the Calvin Klein Chanel, Gucci, or Giorgio Armani Moschino, a liar The novel is famously written in the first person. Duncan, from your point of view, I mean, the big thing in musicals is always who sings and when do they sing. Um, why, and why the hell, why the hell do they sing? <laughs> yes. So, I mean, this first person thing, is, is that helpful? Has your book writer kept that in the piece? Once I had a, a bead on, on what this musical might be, and once I had reread the book and I was kind of and got excited about it, it was relatively easy to understand kind of how to write from the perspective of these characters. And partly because, you know, having gone to an Ivy League university in the late eighties and early nineties, like I knew a lot of folks who had a very similar kind of ethos and kind of <laughs> way of thinking about the world. So some of this kind of language kind of came really naturally to me, um, maybe even a little too naturally, <laughs> to, to, to kind of disturbingly <laughs> easy sometimes to kind of get into the headspace of some of these guys. So I think that that is something that actually just made the process much more fun in a way. I'm a huge fan of Spring Awakening. I think it's one of the best musical theatre scores, not because you're sitting here, of the last couple of decades. And what was so wonderful about it was the whole colour of the piece was part and parcel of it. And there are so many generic musicals mm. nowadays that when, when you hear one that actually is comes from a different place, that's very exciting. What do you feel about the whole business of musicals, Duncan, and, and <laughs> how generic they have become and the people who break the mould and go I out just, on a limb? You know, when, whenever I go to see a musical, I just sit there. I mean, nine times out of ten, I sit there in the seat and I go, my God. It is so hard to make a good musical. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that can go catastrophically wrong. And it just, there's everything about it from the narrative to the tone to obviously the music and to the casting and, and the kind of visual elements. All these things have to kind of find this weird lockstep balance for the thing to work. And it's an alchemy, and you can't. You know, you just have to kind of go through the process and work really hard with smart people to get it to that place. Because if you don't get the alchemy right, it's just, it doesn't matter what you do. It's not, it's not mm. about hard work, necessarily. Mm. What would you say is the sound world, or the particular colour of this piece? I mean, is it 80s kind of synth, kinetic pop? Yeah. Initially, what I felt when I read the book was, okay, this could be really interesting if the score was completely electronic. So if it was all analog synthesizers and drum machines and sounds that were <clears throat> not that it's just just retro and of the era because synthesizers have been obviously happening since the late 60s and currently they're as in vogue as they've ever been so it's this idea of kind of just using using sounds that are completely inorganic as a way of thinking about this set of people who they're they're only interested in the surfaces of things, you know, mm -hmm. kind of ha mm -hmm. how they look and what they wear. The insides are kind of ignored or, or pushed down at everyone's peril because look what happens. Should I try on these mod frisons? You can't go wrong, though, with Ferragamo. I have to say that I'm a fan of the purple suede Charles Jordan. But there's nothing remotely ironic when you're wearing Manolo Blahnik. No, there's nothing remotely ironic when you're wearing Manolo Blahnik. Rupert and um, Patrick Bateman, I suppose one of the, the big challenges of this piece is how we make this elegant psychopath appealing to an audience, because I suppose... There's got to be a degree of that to draw an audience in. He's mm. such a linchpin in the piece. It's amazing how many people have an investment on 
who or what Patrick Bateman is. And you know, when I was talking to people about casting beforehand, and you know, so many people came up to me and said, "Whatever else, he must be sexy." That's odd, given he's a psychopathical serial killer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, and in yeah. many ways, in the book, actually, almost sort of autistically unattractive. And, you know, one of the things that's you know, interesting about the piece is his relationship to culture is very satirised, is sort of utterly bland, and yet people have found that sort of very compelling and, and continue to. And Kanye West's recent video kind of shows that as well. I mean, I think, you know, we talked you know, an enormous amount about precedent, you know, what, what the archetypal precedents are here, and that at one level, Sweeney Todd was the obvious one, mm. because, you know, there's another multiple homicidal murderer. Um, he has a very much more articulated reason for doing what he's doing. Sure. Uh, but then, you know, I was obviously... Real motive. Absolutely. And, but then you look at Macbeth or Iago or some more classical figures, or, and I think also there's a very much, a, almost a, like a Dostoevsky and Beauty and the Beast quality in, in the deep narrative between him and his secretary, um, as well as all this comic satire going on. So the production's tone is as hard as the, as the musical's tone to get right. And what I found interesting so far is how actually there's almost danger of him being too sympathetic. Uh, because I think his, mm. his world is so clearly invidious. Yes. Uh, and that strange thing of the nature of theatre, uniquely in an, as an art form, is if you put a man or woman alone on stage, you, your compassion just pours towards them, you know, mm. whatever they're doing. Mm. And that's, that's very powerful. Right? Of course, you have Matt Smith, who is, I mean, how to shuck off the, the mantle of mm. Doctor Who in mm. one easy step. But, I mean, that brings its own baggage, doesn't it? Because he, he has such an adoring audience. Why did you cast him? Well, I mean, it's the, forget the triple threat, it's the sort of <laughs> quintuple threat. I mean, you need someone who can sing, who can move, who can act, who has huge days of charisma. I mean, he dominates the piece more than any other show I've done, far more than Hamlet. I mean, he's in every single scene pretty much wow. at every moment. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and, and it's a young, you know, a young man. You can't, it's not, you're not going to be casting after a huge experience because Bateman's only 20, 26, 27. You know, Matt, before Doctor Who had got a lot of theatre and a sort of award-winning theatre under his belt, so I knew he could be on stage and hold the stage. You know, I think, and funnily, we were talking about Bateman, and I think Brett says, you know, one of his ways into, or one of his starting points for Bateman was Bateman is desperate to fit in, and I think either, either Brett or uh, Christian Bale said the best way to think of him is as an alien who's come to Earth and is trying to understand how people behave. And I was mm. talking to Matt about this the other day and we talked at length and he said, oh, well, a bit like Doctor Who, then. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, um, yeah. I mean, the, the book is full of musical references, mm. uh, Duncan, the, the soundtrack in Patrick Bateman's head, if you like. You know, we've got Huey Lewis and Robert Palmer and Whitney Houston and yes. rather disturbingly um, Genesis and that Invisible Touch is <laughs> yeah. a favourite album of mine <laughs> which is worrying okay. um, but are I'm you his... using this material in the, in, in the score at all? We are, we have kind of half a dozen songs of the period that we've to greater or lesser degrees have kind of deconstructed and, and used them in different ways sometimes they're happening a cappella sometimes they're kind of remixes Okay. Um, sometimes you know they're more kind of like the original track but yes I think for me that was really in important to have some of that music in there I mean it sounds like you've, you connect your score to these, these songs yeah I mean look I grew up in the 80s very much obsessed with Depeche Mode and New Order and Tears for Fears and the Smiths, and I'm kind of an Anglophile in my musical taste. So this writing, it was something I was really excited to just kind of jump into and, and play with all this electronic music in a way that I always have, but I've ne I haven't put it on my own record so much because I've been a little shy about it. Mm. Um, but it was the other reason why I really loved that Matt was cast in the show because he, he doesn't come from a, a musical theater background, mm. and so his kind of stylistic touchstones are similar to mine you know he you know he was Mr. Radiohead and mm. so that works for me really well as a for Matt as a singer mm. let my someone he could linger on or would he simply move along let my someone I've been listening to some of the demos that you've put together and um, some of the songs literally speak 
for themselves. I mean, hard body mm. and you are what you wear, which is a compendium of designer labels, which uh, yeah. is out there, which is kind it's of fun. the first time I've ever written a list song. So it's, <laughs> you're in very distinguished company, <laughs> musical theatre history. Of that. Um, one of the songs that really leapt out at me when I heard it the first time was "A Girl Before." I'm just curious to know what the context of that song is, because because how do the songs function within the piece? That's the question, I guess. Or are they still in progress? Are we still working? Well, the, I, I, I think they, um, we find often, talking to the performers, that we want them to neutralise, do less, to let them have a glassy kind of opacity to them. But there are a small number of what you might call more ballad-like numbers. Emotional. Guess, emotional, yeah. yeah. And, and The Girl Before is... I, mean, I mentioned the Beauty and the Beast storyline, that the, the, the G and the Secretary uh, developing really from the film, which develops on the novel, posits her as a sort of redemptive figure against Bateman's sort of auto psychopathology and it's a number that um, she sings sort of almost conventionally I mean hilariously we always called it an eponine number the other day in, yeah. the, in, in the show because <laughs> it is the, the girl outside wanting, wanting to be yeah. Uh, and, <laughs> yeah. and Cassie has played eponine before so um, you know one of the things I find hardest about having lived with the score and those demos that you have for a couple of years was you know I love Duncan's singing voice and you get very used to that and actually the sort of sense of it being like an album is really wonderful and, and then suddenly other people with you know women start singing and, and, and actually it's, it's beautiful and completely different yes. um, so and actually we, when we did our workshop in, in New York that was a very powerful yeah. moment looks at me sometimes in a certain way all the fears I have seem to fade away I know that I'm a fool to think that this is real I'm breaking every rule cause this is how I feel please tell me the card sequence is in the show you don't have to give it away, but yeah. I'm, please tell me. It's no, but it's I mean, Lynn, Lynn Page, who's our choreographer, has just done this incredibly, incredibly cool sequence, which I won't give anything away, but <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. The book is full of great one-liners, Batemanisms, if you like, but they're now so well known that they're all in inverted commas. I mean, I expect your book writer has relished using some of them, but... Um, how do you deal with that, Rupert, when, when you know, they are so... Do you just go with it and just present them in inverted commas? I think the book is less well known over here than it is in the States, because, and, and the film as well. I think if you're up on Bateman, then you'll enjoy them being there, and if you don't, if you don't know about him, then you'll discover them. <laughs> I mean, my my favourite is, um, it all comes down to this, I feel like shit, but look great. <laughs> That's my favourite line. What does that say about me? I so it sounds like there's a huge amount of music and choreography, and without giving anything away, give us both of you a flavour of, of the show, as you hope it's going to, well, as it is now materialising, you're in, what, week four of rehearsal? I mean, there's a lot of show. I mean, there's a lot of numbers and a lot of songs. Very ambitious. <laughs> the set is kind of pretty... Crazy as well. For yeah, um, well, it's the wonderful Ed Devlin, isn't yeah. it? So, um, you know, we've talked a lot about some of the more serious themes in it, but on the other hand, it is sort of like a restoration comedy. It's sort of about vain, ridiculous, self decorating, self aggrandizing, often mindless people chasing foibles and strange objectives, just as you would in the way of the world. And it's, it's a great a, parallel. <laughs> actually, yeah. it, it just happens that, that it's execution rather than marriage at times. <laughs> What's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> Even if this story is over rough and gory, it's not a fable, it's not an allegory, no cautionary tale, no memento mori, or a vague perhaps. So yeah, there's an awful lot of show, there's an awful lot of music in it. Does everybody get to sing or is or is it very much focused on Patrick? David Trubsall has been doing these really, really cool vocal arrangements. So there are several places where you have these really kind of fantastic acapella sections and these very kind of 
full things. And so how many are we? 16, 17 in the cast? 15. Right? 15. Yeah. So there's a lot of great voices there. And it's really fun for me when they kind of when they all chime in. I just, I love people who know what they're doing in the vocal arrangement world. <laughs> David definitely does. You certainly pick your subjects for musicals, don't you? <laughs> but I think that's great. Well, the next one I'm doing involves like, you know, 11-year-old kids and animals, so <laughs> the precedent's <laughs> going to be broken, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, the only thing I have left really to ask is, should we take heed of the directive? Patrick Bateman, live on stage, bring a raincoat. <laughs> <laughs> well, the... Um... I mean, the amount of discussions I've had about blood so far would make you make you lose yours. But it's definitely a musical for people who maybe haven't been to a lot of musicals, who might who might not naturally come to South Pacific. But but equally, I think it's a musical for people who do really love musicals as well. Roberto, our book writer, is a real musicals junkie, and you know he was involved in Spider Man, the, the sort of the rewrites of Spider Man, and then doing a couple other Broadway musicals. And he is absolutely schooled in everything musical theatre, and and so there's a lot of the more conventional world in it as well. Well, what are the what are the shows that have had a lot of blood? The tenor diminished more. Sweeney Todd. Sweeney Todd. It's more than any. We'll be more original. <laughs> Should we be afraid? <laughs>